Hello and welcome to Choose a Fi. Today on the show, we have a mailbag episode where we're answering your questions that you've sent in through my email newsletter and through our feedback at chooseafi.com email address. And I have my good friend, Cody Garrett, to help give an expert opinion on this. Cody is a CFP and the founder of Measure Twice Money. He joined us back in episode 352, and he is quite possibly the person that I reference the most in my newsletter. And he's just putting out incredibly helpful content every single week on Twitter and Facebook. And I'm just so happy to have him here. And we're going to talk through a bunch of questions, including inflation and financial independence, ACA subsidies and early retirement, tech stock over concentration, capital gains taxability, and Roth 401k versus Roth IRA. This is going to be a really wonderful episode. And with that, welcome to Choose That Fine. Cody, thank you for being here. I am so excited for this. Yeah, it's so nice to be here again. The Shoes FI community is like, uh, like I wish that was my neighborhood. <laughs> like these are my people. So I'm really excited <laughs> to be here. Oh, I love that. I love that. And it's funny because in 2024 and beyond, I'm actually really focusing on our Shoes FI local groups. So to hear that this is my community, this is who I who I want to live near in essence, right? Like be part of my life. That's something I'm really working on in 2024. So all right, Cody, let's get right to it. We have five questions ideally that we'd like to get to. So the first one came in from Wilson. And Wilson said, something that seems to come up a bit in the Facebook group is the concept of how inflation affects your FI number, especially if you're a long way from achieving that number or determining when you're coast FI. You always discuss this by using a 7% return rate because that is a real rate of return already subtracting out inflation. I think some people get confused and think that you also need to inflate your annual spending to get your true cost, say, 30 years from now. My understanding is that if you use 6 or 7%, you basically are projecting what would be the same spending power in the future, as opposed to the actual dollar value. This might be something to clarify on the podcast sometime. So, okay, Cody, this is the time to clarify. Let's, let's go through Wilson's question. And I guess, how would you quick hit respond to this? Like, Any thoughts or anything that jumps out to you that you'd love to kind of correct the record on? Yeah. So I, this is a great question. I mean, I just mad respect for the people writing in because they ask great questions that we should be asking, but we aren't yes. often. So this is a great observation actually for two reasons. Number one. So as you mentioned, Wilson, you know, although the US stock market, we typically focus on BTSAX and some of these broad market index funds, you know, that's historically achieved average annualized total returns over 10%, right? You hear people say it all the time, oh, the market does 10%, right? But the average annualized inflation adjusted return, as you mentioned, the real return has actually been 7%. So you can see a big difference there. And as you know, over long periods of time, that difference can make a big difference. So we want to ensure that we can maintain purchasing power. And we know that compounding effect of those small percentages over many decades. And the second reason your observation is fantastic is that that 4% rule, that 25 times expenses that we often use within our community to calculate our FI number, that accounts for inflation adjustments, but only once retirement distributions begin, not between now and retirement. So we need to account for inflation on the path to retirement, not just through retirement. So many DIY investors within our community, you know, we're assuming that our FI number will be 25 times our current expenses, not our future expenses. And you know we don't want to be unpleasantly surprised if we realize that we're behind <laughs> because we haven't accounted for that 2 to 3% annualized inflation rate. Interesting. So Wilson, I think your understanding is correct, but I actually want to do some clarification. You know, without getting too deep into the numbers, there are actually three calculations required to determine if you've reached Coast FI adjusted for inflation. And by the way, um, I actually have a Coast FI inflation adjusted calculator we can put in the show notes if people want to nerd out a little bit. <laughs> okay, awesome. We will definitely have that in the show notes. So you can always find that on chooseify.com or just on the show notes on whatever podcast player you're listening to this on? Yeah, so the, the calculations that go into it, there are three calculations. And you know the calculator, of course, will do it for you. But I think it's important for us to understand where does inflation come into the calculation? Because I think what you're mentioning, Wilson, is a lot of people, they consider inflation three times. <laughs> like they, they overcompensate because they're maybe they're right. worried about inflation. So they keep adding inflation to the calculation, even though it's already in there, right? So the first calculation is simply to understand the future value of your current expenses adjusted for inflation. So let's say I needed to distribute $75,000 a year, right, in today's purchasing power, but in retirement 15 years from now, 
So the first calculation I have to do is what is $75,000 of purchasing power 15 years from now? I would actually need to distribute over $113,000 in the first year of retirement 15 years from now, assuming a 2.8 annualized inflation rate. Okay. So Cody, just real quick for anybody, obviously they can go to your calculator, but if they had just like a regular calculator or Microsoft Excel, is that just the 75,000 basically times 15 years raised to 1.028? Right. And it's actually even easier in Excel because you can do a, it's called a future value calculation. Nice. Okay. Very cool. So if we wanted 75,000 of purchasing power 15 years from now, we might actually have to distribute 113,000, you know, not even including taxes or things like that. So the first calculation is saying, what is my annual spend inflation adjusted for when I want to retire you know, multiple years from now? The second calculation, you, know, you need to calculate the portfolio balance that you need to have in your first year of retirement. So that's like your FI number, but it's actually your FI number when you retire, not you know, as of today. So the investment return variable is adjusted for inflation again in this calculation, since inflation also affects your purchasing power throughout retirement, not just between now and when you retire. So these first two calculations say, okay, inflation on the path to retirement and inflation all the way through retirement. And then the third calculation is that you need to calculate your coast FI number, right? How much you need in your investment portfolio today to not need to make any additional contributions. Since the previous calculations to and through retirement already included the inflation adjustment, you don't have to do it again. So the calculator we'll share in the show notes will like do all that for you. But I want to let you know that we want to make sure that we don't add inflation to that final calculation because that would actually you know, make you seem like you need more, more money than you actually need to. Okay. That is very, very interesting. There's a lot, a lot in there, obviously. So <laughs> yeah. we could say it in a different way too. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and let's try that. So as I think about inflation and your fine number, you always hear it in two different ways. And again, this, I would love your clarification on, are we overthinking this? Are we being too conservative? Are we basically building it in multiple times? So the ways that you generally hear about inflation is like you said, the total return is probably closer to 10%, but the inflation adjusted real return is probably closer to 7%, maybe a little bit higher. So generally, when you are trying to figure out your compounding using, let's say, the rule of 72 or something, if mm -hmm. you said, okay, I'm going to get a 7% real return, your money would basically double every approximately 10 years, a little bit more than 10 years, just 72 divided by seven, right? So as I'm understanding this, inflation is built into that already because now you've reduced it to get down to real return. So, okay, that's how I think about it in one. But then you also hear people talking about, okay, well, my return is actually going to be seven or 8%, but I'm only withdrawing three or 4%, the safe withdrawal rate, at whatever you decide that is. And, and since we've been talking about 25 times, we'll say 4% rule of thumb. So 4% withdrawal rate. Most people say, all right, you're only doing 4% because you're building in some cushion for inflation between your total return of 7 or 8% and your withdrawal rate of 4%. Now, Cody, as I'm hearing you describe over the last five minutes, I'm wondering if, are we baking in this in twice? Maybe this comes back to a confusion a little bit about the 4% rule. I think understanding that, first of all, the 4% rule is inflation adjusted and it's, math, you know, and it's in its white paper, right? But at the same time, uh, the 4% rule also is you know, a different portfolio. We've effectively in the FI community used it as a rule of thumb for just saying, are we going in the right direction? So our 25 times expenses, the 4% rule is just a place to start. And actually, this is a great point. I know this is a little sidebar, but it's really important that we don't ignore other future income sources when calculating you know, our COAST FI number, because your safe withdrawal rate might actually be much higher than 4% in early retirement and then decrease much lower, for example, social security, right? <laughs> you know, I, I would just tell everybody here that the 4% number is just giving you general guidance of how to think about, do I have enough? But you know, it's probably not a good idea to try to go strictly with the 4% rule through the end of life. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's interesting. I think a lot of people in the FI community basically completely discount Social Security as if it's not going to be there. And I think, obviously, we can never you know, fortune tell what the future is going to be. But it seems even if it goes, quote unquote, bankrupt, it seems highly, highly, highly likely at minimum, we're going to get 70% of what we expect as of today. Again, not prognosticating. You can't know what the political future, I'm, I'm, that's not a game I play. But many, many experts suggest that that's 
essentially a worst case scenario, barring some catastrophe. So I think most people in the FI community that I talked to, Cody, counted as zero in their projections, which is kind of ludicrous. Yeah, I, I think you're right that you know, social security, I always call it the, you know, it's the, it's the gravy on the mashed potatoes, right? <laughs> it's not the main course. So, you know, I always said, you know, it's, it's a nice thing to have and the taxes that come along with it are you know, a nice problem to have. You know, kind of closing this conversation about inflation adjusted returns, keep in mind that, you know, that 7% average, average doesn't mean it happens every year. There's been a lot of content around this of, you know, averages versus annualized returns and things and ranges. But for example, the S&P 500, that US stock market index, the average has been 7% real return, inflation adjusted, but the range of annualized returns over 35 year periods has been between 5% and 10% real return. So, you know, seven is like everybody kind of does the middle number, the seven. But I mean, when you're playing around with a calculator, like why not look at what happens more conservatively, right? Say what happens if it's 5% real return? What if it's 10, right? So create a range for yourself and start to think, hey, if I did get 5% instead of seven, how could I adjust my life to maintain my early retirement objective? And Brad, to come back to your question about 4% versus 7%, 7%, we think about this as an average, but in retirement, when you're taking distributions in retirement, you have to be worried about this thing called sequence of returns risk. So that difference between the 4 and 7% is really helping with the variability of returns, especially in the first decade of early retirement. Okay, awesome. Cody, that's really, really helpful. I think we answered Wilson's question. And uh, who knows? Deep next time. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, yeah, you never know. There might be follow-ups. I suspect there might be. So uh, <laughs> it's a really important thing. It certainly is. So, okay, let's move on to question number two. This came in from Jennifer. Jennifer said, I'd really appreciate if you could outline how an early retiree should approach planning for strategic withdrawals while considering the potential benefit of ACA subsidies. I'm sure that the advice will need to consider what is available in the pre-tax, post-tax Roth buckets, but let's assume there is enough in all three buckets. So, okay, Cody, we're talking ACA subsidies, so basically for healthcare premiums. I know a lot of people who are in their working years and basically have to pay their own premiums are looking at $1,500 a month for families. And mm -hmm. obviously this is a massive, massive line item in people's budgets, but with the potential for having lower, dramatically reduced income, there's a potential for significant subsidies, bringing that down close to zero. But like Jennifer is saying, you don't want to mess it up, right? So there's a lot to consider here. Yeah. So the ACA health insurance subsidy, you know, technically this is called the premium tax credit, the PTC. You'll see that on the IRS tax forms and things. So your eligibility for this credit is based on your family size, your age, your income, and where you live. So we'll talk about some of those variables a little bit, but keep in mind, this is a credit. So a credit, a tax credit reduces your taxes owed dollar for dollar rather than a deduction, which is just, just reduces the amount of income that's taxed. So with a credit that could be this substantial, you know, it may be worth prioritizing this in early retirement. And I would say, yeah, most people, if they don't plan around this, this will be their highest expense. I've met many families where their monthly premiums exceed their mortgage payment. Yeah. And they didn't expect that. They always expected, you know, housing and transportation to be, you know, up there. But really, if you don't have a plan, uh, the plan will hit you over the head. <laughs> Lack of plan. So yeah. individuals and families can actually save over $10,000 per year on their health insurance premiums through the health insurance marketplace. So that's the place where you go, you know, shop in the public. Some people call it the exchange, right? By right. having control, you have to have control over what's called your modified adjusted gross income. For most retirees, this is just a fancy way of saying your adjusted gross income. And most people aren't going to have tax exempt, you know, municipal bond interest or social security because they're in early retirement. And sometimes they're controlling income that they don't need municipal bonds necessarily. So effectively, your income plays a huge role in this because your income you know, currently has to be between 100% and 400% the federal poverty level to receive an ACA subsidy. And right now there's actually no ceiling on that 400%. So you can get a little bit higher than that. But let's assume, like you said, you have a nice balance of pre-tax, taxable and tax-free buckets, which is the, you know, everybody wishes they had that <laughs> in early retirement. Hopefully you do. So here's what I call the standard distribution order of operations for maximizing those credits. So, you know, you kind of do this in the order of what has the least amount of tax impact first. So first, you're going to start by distributing, you know, the ability to maintain your desired lifestyle and living expenses by just taking money out of your, your savings account, your checking account, and your taxable brokerage account, possibly using like tax harvesting or you know, really trying to take the most amount of money with the least amount of tax consequence first out of those taxable brokerage accounts. 
If you need more money to maintain your living expenses, which is the most important thing right here, right? Living in retirement is more important than you know, saving some taxes. <laughs> of course. Okay? So the, the next step after savings, checking, taxable brokerage accounts is taking money out of those pre-tax retirement accounts, assuming you have access. You know, some of those ways to access an early retirement, rule of 55, substantial equal periodic payments. If you have a 457B, right, there are some options there that I'm sure, Brad, you probably covered on a lot of other podcast episodes. You know, and by the way, the third would be Roth accounts, Roth accounts, and also uh, your HSAs, your health savings accounts. But that's a last resort. Most early retirees are able to maintain their lifestyle with just checking, savings, taxable brokerage, and pre-tax accounts if necessary. So once you've met your living expenses that you need, then you say, okay, where does my income sit? Right? You need to include your interest and dividend income from your taxable brokerage accounts and things. But once you figure out where you sit, you can go to healthcare.gov forward slash C dash plans. C like S E E, Cody? Yeah, C. Like I can I can see it. I can see it in the in the future, right? Yeah. So you can actually research the cost of the health plans and also your healthcare subsidies year round, not just during open enrollment. So if like in the middle of March, you can go kind of estimate what it might be for the year. So once you've met your living expenses, then you can figure out, okay, sometimes you actually might need more income to get above that 100% of the poverty level for your family size. So that might mean doing some Roth conversions or selling more stocks in your taxable brokerage account with unrealized capital gain. So you always prioritize your lifestyle and then you say, how else do I need income? Or by the way, you might've already hit where you like adding more income would reduce your credit. So you, maybe you don't want to do more. So effectively it's get enough to live <laughs> and then figure out how much more income you need, whether from Roth conversions or selling more stocks with you know, appreciation. Yeah, very, very interesting. And there's an interplay here with a, a future question we're going to tackle on this podcast. Maybe we'll just do it next. That's coming in from Josh. So I like how you set this up where you're talking about taking from the certain buckets first before maybe doing a Roth IRA conversion or creating a taxable event from a pre-tax account. I think that's one of the most important clarifications here is when you pull money out of a traditional IRA or 401k, the money that you pull out of that, the entirety of that is a taxable event. So that is taxable income, 100% of it, as opposed to when you, let's say, sell from a, a regular brokerage account, the only taxable event is the capital gains, which is basically the selling price less your basis, which is what you bought it for. So it's a much smaller amount. And potentially if they're long-term cap gains and and it can be either 0%, 15%, or I guess 20% is, is the highest. Anyway, there are a lot of considerations here, but just super quickly, let's go through, let's say somebody's expenses were $40,000 and you're telling them to pull out of certain accounts, but then you want to make sure you get over 100% of the poverty level, right? So that would most likely mean you're pulling money out of a pre-tax account. So just quickly talk through that. Yeah. So let's say somebody's just retired. They need $40,000 in their first year of early retirement. They most likely have that much money just in savings, checking, and taxable brokerage accounts, maybe without even having to sell anything. So effectively, you're pulling money out of the accounts that don't have any tax consequence to begin with. You aren't taxed on the money you take out. You're only taxed on the things that you sell and the dividends and interest income that you receive. So Let's say that you had to sell things in your taxable brokerage account to get access to that 40000 to maintain your lifestyle. So you'd sell that. I mean, you might have some tax harvesting opportunities to sell some things at losses and some things at gains. But actually, the goal here is not to do anything tax fancy. It's just saying, how do I get access to the money I need to live as tax efficiently as possible? In your example, Brad, let's say that you only, by pulling 40000 out of these accounts, you ended up having you know, taxable income of $5,000. Okay. And that would be capital gains on selling something from brokerage, hypothetically, right? Right. And yeah, let's say that you have you know $5,000 from that. So that's going to show up as income for these ACA tax credits. But let's say that to get over the 100% poverty level as an individual, a single, I actually need to have modified adjusted gross income of $20,000 to get the maximum premium tax credit without dropping in the Medicaid area. So right. So I have 5,000 of income that I took to get my money that I needed for my lifestyle. Now I need $15,000 of income from another place to get to that $20,000 level that I need to get that premium tax credit. So I'm immediately going to say, okay, how am I going to get $15,000? Usually in early retirement, you're going to actually do this by doing a Roth conversion. So I might do a $15,000 Roth conversion 
from a pre-tax account to a Roth account, withhold 0% because I don't want to pay the 10% penalty on even the taxes that are withheld from a conversion before 59 and a half. So with all that said, now I have income of $20,000. And in this scenario, by the way, I'm single. (laughs) I've got a standard deduction in 2024 of $14,600. I practically have no income tax, right? But not only do I have like no income tax, but I also am getting my health insurance practically free in 2024 rather than paying $20,000 for it. Ah, Yeah, that's amazing. And so, right, the AGI is before you take the standard or itemized deductions, right? So that's why you started with that amount of saying, hey, it's the 5,000 of capital gains plus this extra amount that I need to take out to get over that threshold. I guess the other follow-up question, and, and we will move on to the other related question, is let's say you mess something up and you're over 400% of the federal poverty level. Is there like a cliff where it goes to zero and you basically shot yourself in the foot or how does that work? They've eliminated the cliff for now, but the best way to do it, the best way to answer that question, you know, going back to that healthcare.gov forward slash C dash plans is just, you can actually just keep typing in numbers to say, like you can just, you know, push back and then assume your income and then see what the premium tax credit will be. And then, you know, just go back and forth to see, uh, I actually make charts. Maybe I can share this as well. Like I effectively make a chart to show like, where is your cliff? Because everybody's cliff is going to be different. It's worth going on the website to just estimate yourself, even before you retire, to see what might it be like, you know, in a few years when I retire. Cool. All right. I love that. This is really important, everybody. So this is some homework that's actually really worth your time because we're talking, like Cody said, this is potentially a five figure per year issue that you could could get these subsidies. So this is really important to get right. So, all right, Cody, I think we answered that. And let's move on to Josh's question, which really does line up here nicely right after this. So a question I've been struggling to answer is how do I accurately calculate my future retirement tax liability when factoring in multiple sources of income that differ in taxability? Let me explain. When I retire in my early 50s, hopefully, I'll have income from a military pension, rental property, and a taxable brokerage account. I would like to figure out what is considered taxable income in that case. Married filing jointly, a couple can draw... $94,050 $94,050 in 2024 from long-term capital gains without paying a penny in taxes. How does that change when adding in income from a pension, rental property, and later in life, Roth and traditional accounts? Behind the scenes, I'm trying to figure out if I should be maxing on my Roth or traditional accounts instead. So, all right, Cody, this is yet another really important one. How would you tackle this? Yeah, I think we have to start actually with this important note that taxable income is actually a technical IRS term. So taxable income, a lot of us think of taxable income as you know, income that could be taxable. But in reality, you know, taxable income is not the same as gross income. So we've talked a little bit about these standard deductions, right? So when you calculate your taxes in retirement, you start by adding up your various income sources. Then you subtract what are called adjustments to income. In early retirement, usually the only thing that you might have is an HSA deduction, a health savings account deduction, right? Then, you know, by subtracting out the adjustment to income, you've arrived at AGI, that adjusted gross income. But then you reduce AGI even further by subtracting the standard or itemized deductions, finally arriving at taxable income. So, you know, first, just to clarify that term, taxable income is really important here because taxable income is not the same number as the amount of money that you receive from those various sources. So the easiest way, if you want to follow along and you're a visual person, the easiest way to understand the taxability of these various income sources is to walk through a federal tax return, a form 1040, line by line. You know, it sounds intimidating, but thankfully it's only two pages and (laughs) maybe we can put in the show notes. I actually have a video just showing literally line by line how I I do it. Oh, nice. That's brilliant. So we can go ahead and just share that with the Buy community. So I'll walk through that. But to simplify this for you and your situation, so wages from a job you know, a military pension, net rental income, Roth conversion amounts, those are all included in taxable income. And they're they're taxable at ordinary tax rates. So those are the ones you typically hear about, you know, marginal tax rates, the 10%, 12%, 22, 24, 32, 35, 37%. And your income spreads across those brackets. It's not like all your incomes in one bracket. No, it's not like if you go into the 32, not all your income is at the 32. It's spreading across all those lower marginal rates. But then your qualified dividends and long-term capital gains within your taxable brokerage accounts, they're also included in taxable income, that term taxable income. 
but they're actually taxed separately at favorable capital gains tax rates at 0%, 15%, or 20%. So although the qualified investment income is stacked on top of your ordinary income to determine taxable income, you will calculate your taxes separately on those amounts. So I have a fun example here. I try not to go too much down the rabbit hole. (laughs) So in your example, there's a married couple filing jointly. Their only form of income is a realized long-term capital gain of $94,050, right? That's their only income in 2024, all within the 0% capital gains tax bracket. But as mentioned before, we can't forget about that standard deduction that they get. So in 2024, they actually get a standard deduction of $29,200. So adding that all together, right? Although the capital gains tax rate of 0% is up to taxable income of 94,000, you can actually have adjusted gross income of (laughs) $123,250. That's amazing. So just keep in mind that if you are trying to do, you know, we, we call this tax gain harvesting, which is when we have realized long-term capital gains at that 0% bracket, don't forget the standard or itemized deductions because that's going to give you even more room on top of that. Yeah. Cody, that was a uh, tour de force on understanding tax brackets. I think this is so critical. And yeah, capital gains harvesting is actually a really interesting one. We talked about that way back when on episode 18R. I mean, we're talking at the very beginning of Choose a Vi. Wow, 18. <laughs> 18R, yeah, April of 2017. But yeah, you hit on so many important things here. And I think a lot of people don't really have a full grasp on how our federal tax brackets work, how the marginal tax and that interplay of the standard deduction. And it's really, it's so powerful now, especially with these enormous standard deductions we get. I mean, really, if you're looking at, like for anybody out there, just Google 2024 tax brackets. So this is even aside from what we're talking about right now, but just generally to get a better understanding of this, the 10% bracket for married filing joint goes up to $23,200. But now that is taxable income which Cody very specifically said, like these terms matter. There's a difference between AGI, which is adjusted gross income and taxable income, which is after that standard deduction. So think about this. You have 23,200, but you also then had that $29,200 worth of that standard deduction. So when you add 29,200 to 23,200 also with that tax bracket, that means If you had $52,400 worth of income, regular wages, let's say, that was all that was on your tax return, you would take $52,400, you would get to subtract out that $29,200 standard deduction, and your taxable income then would be $23,200, and that you would apply entirely at that 10%. So you would be paying basically $2,300 on $52,000 worth of income. That's how powerful And, these... and that's a 4.4% effective tax rate. Isn't that astonishing? An effective tax rate is another important one. So basically, we're talking $2,320 of tax on over $52,000 worth of income. So it's the tax liability divided by your gross income. And that gets you, hey, what's the tax rate that I'm basically paying on this gross income of 52000 it comes out to about 4% in this case, which is astonishingly low, <laughs> staggeringly low, right? And that 4.4% effective tax rate is probably much lower than the marginal tax rate at which you deferred that income when you you know, contributed to your traditional 401ks, traditional IRAs in the past. Right, which is another superpower of the financial independence community, right? And which is why, to a very large degree, we talk about control what you can control, which is your tax rate and your tax liability in the current year, which is why we love pre-tax accounts where, hey, this money is going in at a very high marginal rate. And then when I pull it out, I can pull it out at a very low effective rate, essentially. Yeah. I love in this conversation, just covering some of those, you know, those bigger details on marginal, effective, you know, capital gains versus ordinary. There's a lot of education to be shared. I'm glad that we ran through that. Yeah, that was a good one. And and just the final word on taxes, since I am, a, I guess, nominally a CPA, you mentioned before tax credits versus tax deductions. I think this is one of the most important things and people just don't really understand it. So let's say you were at that 10% marginal tax bracket, right? And you had a $2,000 tax deduction, okay? That $2,000 tax deduction would only be worth 10% of that. 
So it would be worth $200 in reduced tax liability to you. So you save $200 out of your pocket, basically, as opposed to a tax credit, which, as you said before, is a dollar for dollar reduction in the tax liability. So a $2,000 tax credit is literally like a child worth, tax credit. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's worth $2,000 to you. So a massive distinction between tax credit and tax deduction. All right, Cody, I think we covered that. So let, why don't we move on to Julia's question? Julia said, I wanted to reach out and ask a quick clarifying question that might help the community. I'm a 25-year-old accountant and working on maxing on my Roth and 401k this year, but I'm a bit confused about the Roth and 401k discussion. From what I understood, you can contribute $22,500 to a 401k for the year and $6,500 into your Roth for the year to max out both vehicles. But my company offers a Roth 401k and a regular 401k, and I am seeing limitations on my Fidelity portal that's indicating I can only put $22,500 between the two accounts. In this case for next year, would it make more sense slash be possible for me to put $23,000 into my employer 401k next year and put $7,000 into a Roth IRA that's separate from my employer-sponsored options? I guess I'm just confused on why I can't contribute the full $29,000 into my employer-sponsored options, but I'm assuming this might have something to do with the fact that it's a Roth 401k and not a Roth IRA. So, okay, Cody, there's a lot there. The question is, <laughs> is somewhat confusing, but I think at the heart of it, this is actually a pretty simple one. I'd love to hear you tackle this. Yeah. So it's very common for us to hear, especially, you know, kind of we, we, we truncate our sentences. We, you know, we, we try to make things really short. So you'll commonly hear people say, I have a Roth, right? Um, but it's, you know, my, my analogy here is it's similar to eating vanilla ice cream and telling people I have a vanilla, <laughs> right? So it's just the flavor, but it's not the food. So easy way to simplify this is Roth is not an account type. So the word Roth, when you see that in front of an account type, you know, when you see the word Roth, that identifies the retirement account's tax characteristics, which means that the contributions are made with after-tax funds and the qualified distributions may be received tax-free. So you could actually have a Roth 401k, a Roth 403b, a Roth 457b, a Roth IRA, just like you could have vanilla ice cream, vanilla cookie, right? You're extending the analogy for you. Hmm. So to simplify this, a 401k, which is an employer-sponsored retirement account, and an IRA, which stands for Individual Retirement Arrangement or Account, they're actually completely separate account types with their own contribution rules and limits. So how much you put into a 401k will have nothing to do with how much you can put into an IRA, assuming that you meet those rules. So in 2024, traditional and Roth employee 401k contributions are limited to a combined $23,000 if you're under age 50. But traditional and Roth IRA contributions have their own combined limit of $7,000 in 2024 under age 50. So assuming that you have the income to contribute, right, and you meet the rules, your traditional Roth limits within each type of account are combined. So traditional Roth 401k, those are combined. And traditional Roth IRA, those are combined. But the accounts themselves are completely separate. And how much you put into one or the other does not affect the other account. Brilliant. All right. That was very succinct. And very thorough. So I, I think we covered Julia's question there. This is not the distinction between Roth and traditional. It's the distinction between an IRA and a 401k. And each of those accounts, regardless of their characteristics, each of those accounts has their own separate limits. So yeah, Cody, that was fantastic. And we have one more question here from Bill. And Bill said, like many people, my portfolio has a high concentration in those tech stocks that have had a huge growth in the last 20 years. In a nutshell, four to five stocks make up nearly 50% of my portfolio, and the rest is diversified among more tech stocks, while only the remaining 25% is in CDs and broader index funds. I've employed Karsten and Fritz's strategy of having a certain amount of expenses and cash so I can ride out some ups and downs for the next three to four years, but I'm still concerned about where to go from there. My goal would be to diversify while limiting current year tax implications. For example, Fidelity would sell all those stocks if they were to manage my portfolio, but they agree with me that they wouldn't do it in my shoes due to the massive current year tax bill that would create because 90% of the value is in capital gains, actually. So any recommendations? Yeah, I really want to answer this with a simplification of a framework, right? The order of operations, this is my framework for how to prioritize which investments to sell, <laughs> you know, which ones to buy, which ones to sell. And, you know, I can tell in the question, fantastic question. And congratulations, by the way, 
for choosing the five, four to five stocks <laughs> actually did well, <laughs> right? You know, actually in that, it's, it's kind of funny. I looked up 10 out of the top 20 holdings within the U.S. technology sector index have underperformed the U.S. stock market on a risk adjusted basis in over the past 10 years. Really? So you, you choosing the four to five, like good for you. <laughs> you did well. You, you know, you beat the casino, right? And now it's time to say, let's take our winnings and have the casino pay the tax <laughs> effectively. <laughs> so I want to go, you know, there's a framework for how to prioritize which investments to sell. And what I can tell by this question is you and maybe even the people at Fidelity are thinking about like in reverse, you're actually prioritizing, you know, the wrong thing or in reverse. So the, the thing that you should actually prioritize, as mentioned before, you should prioritize your ability to maintain your desired lifestyle. And the phrase I use here is, we want to give every dollar a job and a use by date. We say, hey, when am I going to need this money? And once you know when you're going to need the money, it's much easier to decide on a risk adjusted basis, which investments to choose. Cody, let me jump in real quick. When you say a risk adjusted basis, I'm sure a lot of people out there don't know what you mean. Can you define that? Yeah. So risk adjusted means how much risk or how much volatility did you experience to you know, receive that level of return? So let's say that you know, something returns 5%. And another thing returns 5%. You're like, oh, they're the same. But one was a roller coaster on the way to 5%. And one was like the, the five and under ride at the theme park. <laughs> gotcha. Thank you for the clarification. Keep on rocking and rolling. Yeah. So this framework for, you know, figure out what to sell. Number one, your ability to maintain your desired lifestyle. You know, give every dollar a job and a use by date. And this really means just understanding your overall asset allocation. How much money am I going to have in equities? And how much money am I going to have in fixed income and cash? And it sounds like you've already been thinking about that. You've been doing this barbell approach of you know three to four years of cash, and then the rest is an equity, which may work for you in your circumstance. So that's number one is saying, can my portfolio support my lifestyle? Number two in the framework is diversification. And the way I describe diversification is we want our investments within our portfolio to be going in different directions at different speeds. And by the way, different directions doesn't mean we want some going up and some going down, <laughs> right? Of course, we want them all going up, but we want them going up in like varying degrees. And also when things go down, we don't want them all to go down in the same speed, in the same direction, right? So diversification here in terms of your question would be, you know, to diversify, that would mean avoiding company and sector specific risks. So you've identified, right, that you're really heavy in one sector and also really heavy in just a handful of individual companies. And I, I want to mention here, sometimes we think about these large companies that have been around for a long time is being stable. But I want to mention just a, a few percentage points here. You know, even the most popular tech companies have experienced significant price drops. Tesla fell 67% from its all-time high. Netflix fell 75%. Meta, 75%. Google, 40%. Amazon, 50%, right? These are not the types of individual companies that you'd want to own for money that you're going to be spending within the next few years, right? Going back to giving every dollar a job and use by date. And also the technology sector, you said that you have some broad index funds. The technology sector already represents 28% of the US total stock market. So by buying more broad index funds, like you're actually adding even more tech exposure, right? So you've already identified that you need to diversify out of the sector and out of those individual, you know, the, the company specific risks. But here's the third part of the framework, tax optimization, right? Those tax gain, tax loss harvesting, putting the right types of assets and the right types of accounts for tax efficiency. But what I'm finding in this question and what Fidelity has mentioned to you is they're focusing on tax optimization first. There's a phrase people will say, which is don't let the tax tail wag the dog. And another phrase I say, I say it's better to have more income than to pay less taxes. <laughs> and you have been, uh, you know, with four or five stocks making up nearly 50% of your portfolio, like they've done their job. Well done. You know, we can celebrate the wins that those <laughs> tech stocks and your, your, your selection of those tech stocks have had. But it's time to celebrate, right? And be thankful for this good problem to have, which is paying taxes on the income that you've earned by realizing those capital gains. So, you know, I don't understand your whole comprehensive financial ecosystem. But one thing that you mentioned about Fidelity, Fidelity said they would sell all those stocks if they managed them, but they wouldn't do it if they were in your shoes. <laughs> well, here's a really important note, right? They're thinking about diversification and tax optimization but they're not thinking about your ability to maintain your desired lifestyle, which was number one on that list. The reason that they wouldn't do it in your shoes is they are not in your shoes, right? <laughs> so you are the one retiring. You're the one feeling the pressure of, oh, I need some stability in my portfolio. So I would encourage you not necessarily to like sell it all, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I would tell you that you should consider you're not letting 
having to pay capital gains tax rule your decision moving into retirement? Yeah, I think that is very good, broad advice for sure. And I can also see where Bill's issue is and other people in the community who I know, I know even Mr. 1500, Carl from 1500 Days has something like this where a massive portion of his portfolio is Tesla. And it's okay, in a perfect world, and now I'm talking more broadly, in a perfect world, I don't want to be overexposed to this, but I don't want to incur all the tax at this very moment. So I think like you're saying, don't let the tax tail wag the dog, which is important. Understand that- Broadly, broadly. Very broadly, right, right, right. But that said, Mm -hmm. it's always gonna come down to each individual person, of course, your exact situation. We can never know what's going on in your exact financial life. But you do get, like we talked about earlier, especially if this is a married filing joint situation, you get well over $100,000 potentially Assuming you had no other income, you get $100,000 of long-term capital gains that could be at a 0% tax rate. So I guess the slowest possible way to do this would be to max out that 0% every year. But if you're talking, you have millions of dollars, potentially, this is going to take you a couple decades to do this. So I think that's the one extreme, right? Which is, okay, in a perfect world, I would love to get rid of, of this over-concentration, but I want to pay $0 in tax. The other extreme then would be to sell it all in one year and just incur the capital gains tax all in that one year. Now, if it's most of its long-term cap gains, then it's probably going to be at a 15 or or 20%, depending if, if this is really significant income. But you're locking in that tax, which, okay, that might hurt. But now use like the other example, which would have been, hey, I held on to this but damn, that stock went down 70% in a year, a couple of <laughs> years from now, I'd feel pretty silly having worried about paying 15 or 20% tax on this, right? So those are the two extremes, Cody. And I think there may be a case, depending on who this person is, what their exact situation is, to maybe do it over a couple of years. Again, risk tolerance, however you consider, all right, I'd like to shelter as much of this as possible in that 0% long-term cap gains bucket. But it may not be possible depending on the rest of their situation, if they have other taxable income, et cetera. So of course, we can never answer somebody's exact situation on a podcast, but I think we've given them a flavor of of how you'd consider it. Yeah. And I want to add to that, you know, there's a question earlier about, you know, that we answered earlier about the premium tax credits, right? Going through that framework of ability to meet your desired lifestyle, you know, diversification and tax optimization. This is something I would actually prioritize over tax credits, which sounds crazy. Like, why would you say no? to like $10,000 for the tax credit. But just like you said, like I'd rather pay 0%, 15% on you know long-term capital gains, unwinding this and diversifying, than risk losing 70% of the stock itself. And you know, on top of that, this is like the, you know, the tax optimizer in me would say, there are two things I would consider though. I wouldn't necessarily do it all in one year, but I might do it in tranches. I might do part of it in one year, part of it in year two, and part of it in year three assuming, right, that you do have other income sources, you do have some, you know, your risk tolerance and risk capacity is aligned. You know, you can spread your tax liability across multiple years. For example, people are hearing this maybe in January, right? But, you know, some people might be able to just put, you know, some in December, some in January. And even though it's only one month different, it's two tax years. So you can spread that liability. And then second, there's something called a sell stop order, right? Which is to set a trigger to sell the stock if it falls below a certain point. So like in tandem, as you're kind of waiting for next year to sell another tranche of these realized capital gains, you can still set like like a little safety net if the stock does start to drop that you make sure you go ahead and keep as much of the the gain in your security as possible. But with all that said, I think that is very optimized. And there's this term called return on hassle, right? (laughs) To me, I prefer not to add a lot of possibly unnecessary noise and hassle to this situation. And rather just have a deeper conversation about when you bought that stock to begin with, what was your goal? Was your goal to hold this forever? Like to go to the moon? Or was your goal to use this money to support your desired lifestyle? When you come back to why did you save this money and invest this money to begin with, it's going to be much easier to sell that investment, be grateful and celebrate your wins and diversify and get ready for an awesome retirement. Cody, that is the perfect stopping point. Absolute perfect. I really appreciate you coming on. I appreciate the questions, these incredible questions that came in from our community. Please keep them coming. The easiest way to send them in is to 
get my weekly newsletter, which I think if you're listening to this podcast and you're not getting the newsletter, what are you doing? It's it's the other important piece of content that I put out for the Fi community every single week. So just go to literally any page on chooseafi.com and in the upper right corner, it says Fi Weekly Newsletter and just sign up. And then you just literally hit reply to the email that I send out on Tuesday. I read every single one of these replies and these questions go into the Google Doc that I share with Cody and a bunch of our other friends who are going to, you're going to hear from over this year. And we just answer them. And it's really, it just makes for this crowdsourced personal finance show that we've talked about since 2017 when we started. So Cody, where can people find you? People can find me at measuretwicemoney.com, an educational blog, nothing to sell you, just really just giving it all away. So go there and also check out the show notes as I've shared some calculators, some federal tax brackets, just some fun tools for you to play around with. Beautiful. I really appreciate it, my friend. Thank you for the time.